morning everyone and welcome once again to continuous cardiac education program run by the UN Mehta Institute of Cardiology and Research Center. I am going to talk on truncus arteriosus and I will cover the following points in my talk starting from what is truncus arteriosus, then risk factors and embryology of truncus, anatomical considerations, classification, pathophysiology of truncus arteriosus, uh, in investigations and uh, uh, anesthetic management, surgical steps for truncus repair, post-operative management and lastly the uh, long-term complication of the truncus. Uh, Let us start with uh, introduction that is what is truncus arteriosus? It is a cyanotic congenital cardiovascular anomaly characterized by a single arterial vessel with one wall arising from the base of the heart. You can see in this figure, uh, this truncus overrides the large perimembranous VSD and receives mixed blood from both ventricles and supplies blood to the pulmonary, systemic and coronary circulations. It is very rare anomaly and occurs in less than 1% of uh, congenital heart defect. Coming to the embryology. Heart is the first organ to develop in the embryo at around 4 weeks of age. Uh, the following image shows how it uh, uh, develops during the uh, embryo development. So cardiac neural crest cells which differentiate to create the truncoconal ridges migrate abnormally in such a way that bulbar ridges fail to form. This will lead to failed partition of the truncus arteriosus and this will lead to persistent truncus arteriosus. So, there is no formation of the aorticopulmonary septum and no division of the outflow tract. Coming to the etiology, although the exact etiology is not known, but certain risk factors are there. Among these, the one is embryonic exposure to retinoic acid. Uh, it is more commonly seen in infants of diabetic mothers. It is more commonly associated with chromosomal abnormality that is deletion of 22q11 and also present in siblings of truncus patients and also associated with Dijor syndrome around 30 percent of patients. Coming to the anatomical considerations, uh, this image shows the uh, truncus arteriosus in which there is a single uh, semilunar wall that is called the truncal wall that is large and it has a uh, uh, varying number of leaflets from 2 to 6. The most common uh, it is tricuspid and least common is bicuspid. Apart from this the pentacuspid and hexacuspid are present uh, rarely and the truncal wall regurgitation uh, occurs due to this poorly formed leaflets or the leaflet thickening or the dilated truncal root. And this truncal valvular jet is directed towards the left ventricle. Uh, rarely this uh, truncal wall uh, may be stenotic. Now uh, it is also truncus is also associated with the VSD or sometimes there may be uh, intake ventricular septum. This VSD is malaligned, large and conoventricular. It lies immediately below the truncus and separated from the tricuspid valve by the posterior limb of the septal band. So, during closure of the VSD, the risk of complete heart block is less around 3 to 5 percent. Now, associated uh, coronary artery abnormalities are also quite common that includes the uh, narrowing of the ostia or high takeoff of the coronary artery or sometimes the LAD crossing the RVOT and this will contribute toward the high surgical mortality. Uh, the right aortic cars is also common in around 30 percent of cases. Others are interrupted aortic cars, PDA, persistent left SVC, ASD and anomalous subclavian artery. And the associated uh, systemic anomalies include uh, Dijor syndrome that is more commonly seen in 30 percent of patients and others are thymus abnormalities that is T cell uh, immunodeficiency and uh, parathyroid abnormalities causing hypocalcemia, thrombocytopenia, cleft palate and renal agenesis. 
coming to the classification there are two types of classification one is uh, collet and adverts uh, classification that came into uh, existence in 1949 according to this there are four anatomical types and that is uh, uh, done on the base of origin of the pulmonary arteries from the truncal artery in type as you can see in this figure this is type 1 uh, truncus in which the, there is a common arterial trunk arises from the heart which immediately bifurcates into a main pulmonary artery and the ascending aorta. So uh, this is uh, constitute around 70 percent of cases in type 2 the two pulmonary artery arises from the posterior uh, part of the truncus they are very close to each other and arises separately. This is constitute around 29 to 30 percent of cases. In type 3 truncus, the both pulmonary artery arises from the lateral aspect of the truncus and this is very rare around 1 percent of the uh, defect. Th this is type 4 uh, truncus, actually this is called pseudo truncus because the pulmonary artery is not arises from the truncus and the lungs blood supply coming from the collaterals that arises from the descending thoracic aorta. Now this classification is useful to describe pulmonary blood flow in the truncus. In type 1 there is excessive pulmonary blood flow, in type 2 and 3 normal pulmonary blood flow while in type 4 there is decreased pulmonary blood flow. Coming to the second classification that is uh, uh, developed by the Van Prague and Van Prague in 1965. This is done on the base of presence or absence of the conotruncal septum. There are four types uh, in type A1 that is corresponds to type 1 of Collet and Edwards uh, in which there is partial development of conotruncal septum. So there is still aorta and pulmonary artery coexist. In type A2 which corresponds to type 2 and type 3 of Collet and Edwards, the both pulmonary artery arises from the truncal artery and this occur due to the complete absence of the uh, conotruncal septum. Then in type A3, uh, one pulmonary artery is not arising from the truncus and on that part of the lung is supplied by the collaterals while one pulmonary artery arises from the uh, truncus. In type A4, when the truncus is associated with the interrupted aortic arch and PDA is supplying the descending thoracic aorta. This classification is more useful for the surgeons because it gives the clear idea about the anatomy. Coming to the pathophysiology of truncus arteriosus, it is an example of single ventricular physiology in the presence of two well formed ventricles. In this condition the relative blood flow and O2 saturation is dependent on the relative resistance of its circulation. So during the first week of life due to high PVR which limits the pulmonary blood flow patients remain cyanotic with saturation of around 75 to 80 percent. Now after the second week of life due to fall in PVR the QPQS exceeds 1. So these patients have decreased cyanosis with increased saturation to 90 percent or more. Due to this excessive pulmonary blood flow uh, patients have signs of congestive heart failure. That means patients have increased volume overload of left ventricle leading to pulmonary edema. This uh, torrential increased pulmonary blood flow and exposure of the pulmonary arteries to both systolic as well as diastolic arterial pressure results in uh, accelerated development of pulmonary vascular disease. There is also a presence of retrograde flow in the abdominal aorta during diastolic, stealing blood flow from the hepatic, renal as well as from mesenteric circulation. So there is increased risk for necrotizing enterocolitis. This retrograde flow and potential for coronary insufficiency is exacerbated by the presence of truncal valve regurgitations. 
Now the presence of large non-restrictive VSD allows the equalization of pressures in both ventricles and there is bidirectional shunting and complete mixing of systemic and pulmonary venous blood in a functionally common ventricular chamber. This mixed blood is ejected into the truncal root and thus the oxygen saturation is same in aorta and the pulmonary arteries. Uh, for balancing the circulation, the following points should be consider, considered. Uh, the first one is that uh, systemic arterial oxygen saturation depends on the amount of pulmonary blood flow. So, a low pulmonary blood flow to systemic blood flow ratio will reduce arterial saturation, but high QPQS will produce ventricular volume overload without a marked increase in arterial saturation. As the pulmonary and systemic circulations are supplied in parallel from a single vessel in truncus arteriosus, an increase in flow to one circulatory system will produce a reduction in flow to the other system. So, to balance the circulation, the ideal QPQS is maintained that is 1. Coming to the natural history, most infants present with congestive heart failure and cyanosis during the first two weeks of life without surgical correction, mortality during the first year of life is greater than 80 percent with half patients succumbing during the neonatal period. At the end of second year, irreversible pulmonary vascular disease develops rapidly with the infant dying of the effects of chronic progressive hypoxemia. Surgical repair usually contraindicated in older than 2 years with uh, pulmonary vascular resistance index greater than 8 wood units per square meter body surface area. But still a small percent of children will survive past the third year of life with large left to right sun. This occur due to protected pulmonary circulation due to increase in PVR. Coming to the uh, clinical manifestation, how these babies uh, present clinically. So, just uh, immediately after birth, this patient have uh, sinosis and uh, signs of congestive heart failure develop that is tachycardia, tachypnea, difficulty in feeding occur within several days to weeks after birth. Uh, in infants, patient have history of dyspnea with feeding, failure to thrive and frequent respiratory infections due to increased pulmonary blood flow. Coronary ischemia may occur due to low diastolic blood pressure and respiratory distress or lung collapse may occur due to bronchus compression between left pulmonary artery and descending thoracic aorta or dilated truncal artery. On examination, these patients have bounding peripheral pulses, uh, they have wide pulse pressure due to low diastolic blood pressure, there is hyperactive precordium then uh, presence of uh, single second heart sound due to single semilunar valve, then heart's resurgitant systolic murmur uh, present at the left sternal border due to VST, then high pitched early diastolic decrescendo murmur of truncal valve regurgitation may be audible. Uh, now to diagnose this truncus arteriosus, uh, echocardiography is useful and we can note down following features on the echocardiography. This image shows the mid esophageal long parasternal view and we can see a single arterial vessels arising from the heart and there is a presence of single semilunar valve that is called truncal valve and below this truncal valve there is a large VSD. Then there is a dilated biventricular chambers, there is also dilated left atrium. On color doctor uh, examination, we can see this truncal wall regurgitations and there is also some signals of truncal stenosis which occur due to the uh, overflow of blood, but there is the wall is not truly stenotic. So, look for the uh, number of uh, cusp in the truncal wall and assess for the coronary artery pattern and also uh, look for the right side aortic arch that is most common in 30 percent of cases. Coming to the ECG, 
the, the features are non specific most commonly right axis deviation present in 70% of cases bioventricular hypertrophy more commonly left ventricle then left atrial hypertrophy as evidenced by the tall peak p wave on chest x ray the cardiomegaly is usually present with increased pulmonary vascularity but uh, in case of absent pulmonary artery from uh, aorta on that side uh, the vascularity may be decrease or lung fields is oligemic while in the opposite side the increased pulmonary vascularity present right aortic arch commonly present now, this uh, cardiac catheterization or ctpa is uh, indicated for only those cases in which the anatomy is unclear further information is required in terms of the truncal valve or when the status of the pulmonary vasculature is unclear so pvr in this uh, in infants younger than 3 months is only mildly elevated that is 2 to 4 volt units per square meter body surface area coming to the medical management when the patient have congestive heart failure then anti congestive treatment should be started with digitalis diuretics fluid restriction and uh, after load reductions but no attempt should be made to manage truncus medically for any extended period of time but only in the immediate pre operative period for a few days to optimize the child's status before surgery because in the past the deferral of surgery with aggressive medical management lead to a high risk for problems with pulmonary hypertension in the early post operative period coming to the surgical management the, what is the timing of surgery the, ideally the surgery should be undertaken in the neonatal period as early as possible uh, but some center perform surgery between 2 to 3 months of age uh, studies have shown that early repair is indicated due to the rapid development of pulmonary hypertension and high mortality rate in the first year of life if left untreated now following are the criteria for contra indications of surgery these criteria are same as in vsd when this vsd patients develop eisenmengerization syndrome first is when patient have clinically evident cyanosis with saturation less than 70% chest x ray shows decreased pulmonary vascularity or normal pulmonary vasculature echo showing predominant right to left shunt and on cardiac cath pbri greater than 8 volt units per square meter in older children greater than 2 years and which is also not uh, reactive to oxygen therapy now the history of surgery in the 1950s to early 1960 pa bending was performed to restrict the pulmonary blood flow but uh, nowadays it is abandoned due to some disadvantages like it produces distortion of the pulmonary arteries and does not necessarily prevent pulmonary vascular obstructive disease uh, apart from this it has high mortality rate up to 30% but uh, some cases of bilateral pa bending has been reported uh, uh, in cases where the there are contra indications uh, for patients to to going on the cpb like uh, sepsis recent intracranial hemorrhage is are present in 1962 the first documented repair of truncus arteriosus was performed using wireless conduit from rv to pa and closure of the vsd then in 1967 mcgun has first used a valve allograft conduit between rv to pa now anesthesia management so before giving anesthesia one should uh, know the proper pathophysiology of the lesion identify the functional anatomy assess degree of uh, heart failure failure to thrive pulmonary hypertension and cyanosis and search for any Uh, evidence of coronary ischemia due to the frequent association of dysgeor syndrome serum calcium and magnesium levels should be checked and supplementation should be indicated the goal of uh, anesthesia during induction is to balance the circulation to obtain qpqs 1 to maintain reasonable oxygen saturation as well as adequate organ perfusion 
careful titration of anesthetic agents and monitoring of their hemodynamic effects and measures to adjust PVR, SVR and cardiac performance are more important than the selection of a particular anesthetic agent. And depending on the timing of surgery and uh, patient presentations, the hemodynamics will vary and anesthesia must be adapted. So, if the operation is in the first two weeks of life, there is a high chances of pulmonary overflow preoperatively and so measures to increase the PVR and maintain cardiac output are important. PVR is increased by decreasing FiO2, increasing the PaCO2 to 45 to 55 millimeter of mercury, increase PEEP and if severe hypotension occur and if it is associated with a relatively high SaO2, lactic acidosis or ischemic changes on ECG, then it will suggest that lung blood flow is excessive. Management of this will be discussed later on. If the surgery is after 3 to 4 months, the PVR may be high and labile or still low. And if the patient presents after 1 year, the PVR would be increased and the patient may benefit from lowering PVR at induction by administration of pre-medication, increasing the FiO2 and doing hyperventilation, keeping the PaCO2 around 30 to 35. Now in the pre-bypass period, the maintaining a balanced circulation in this patients is very challenging. So chances of myocardial ischemia will be more during the induction or after induction. The pathophysiology of myocardial ischemia is uh, decreased diastolic blood pressure which occurs due to the pulmonary overflow that will lead to decreased coronary perfusion pressure while the ventricular end diastolic pressure is elevated due to the ventricular volume overload. This all this condition increase the chances of myocardial ischemia and ventricular fibrillation while the presence of truncal wall regurgitations will exaggerate this uh, uh, decrease in diastolic blood pressure and uh, presence of tachycardia along with two diastolic blood pressure also precipitates myocardial ischemia. What to do during this condition for treatment of the myocardial ischemia? First ventilation should be altered to assure that the circulation is balanced and pulmonary overperfusion is not the cause. Restrict the volume as volume infusion is unlikely to increase diastolic BP but it further elevate the ventricular and diastolic pressure and further compromises subendocardial perfusion. So it is better to add the inotrop which increase the blood pressure and reduce ventricular dimensions. From the surgeon's point after sternotomy, RPA can be looped and occluded. This drastically reduces runoff into the pulmonary bed and elevates systolic and diastolic BP but ETCOT will fall markedly and will not be an accurate reflection of PSEO2. And FiO2 increase to maintain an SAO2 of 75 to 80 percent. Now, no surgical steps of truncus repair and CPB considerations. Uh, first uh, standard median sternotomy is done, then a patch of anterior pericardium is harvested and treated with 0.6 percent glutaraldehyde for at least 20 minutes, then uh, not the size of the thymus which may be hypoplastic or absent if uh, associated with Dijor syndrome, arterial cannula is placed distally in the ascending aorta following heparinization. It is uh, necessary to snare both pulmonary arteries before CPB because failure to snare the pulmonary arteries results in runoff through the lungs back to the left heart resulting in inadequate systemic perfusion, left heart distension and pulmonary injury. If there is truncal regurgitation then LV is gently massaged to avoid distension and while giving cardioplegia if there is mild to moderate truncal regurgitation then some pressure is applied over the truncal root to build up the pressure. Unless chromosomal evaluation is known, patients with truncus arteriosus should be given irradiated blood products 
due to high incidence of Dijord syndrome and associated T cell deficiencies. Now, this uh, figure shows the surgical steps. First, uh, in this figure, the pulmonary artery is detached from the truncus, and uh, that part of the uh, truncus is uh, closed with the pericardium, and this uh, aorta becomes the neo aorta. Then, the truncal uh, valve is repaired using the commissuroplasty or the valvuloplasty. Then, the incision over the RVOT is made and VSD is closed with PTFE or Dacron patch. Then uh, the distally the wall conduit is anastomos to the pulmonary artery confluence and proximally it is attached to the RVOT site. So, this procedure is same as the Rastelli procedure. Rast the size of the conduit may vary from 8 mm to 16 mm according to the child's uh, weight and age. Coming to the post CPB management, uh, while coming off bypass, heart rate should be maintained at an age appropriate rate. PVR is reduced by using FiO2 of 100 percent with a PCO2 of 30 to 35 milliliter of mercury. Inotropic support is started, milirone is preferred due to its inotropic and leucotropic effects as well as its uh, ability to reduce PVR. Dobutamine or dopamine is also useful uh, because of uh, its inotropic action without increasing the PVR. Adrenaline may be added if there is a ventricular dysfunction. Calcium infusion is also useful if there is associated uh, Dijord syndrome which will cause the hypocalcemia. RV dysfunction may occur uh, due to the ventriculotomy, elevated pulmonary pressures, insufficient preload relative to a stiff RV, metabolic derangements, volume overload secondary to residual left to right stenting or compression of coronary arteries because of the RV to PA conduit. Left ventricular volume overload may occur secondary to truncal wall insufficiency. If uh, mild to moderate truncal regurgitation, then it is well tolerated and will improve postoperatively due to reduction in ventricular volume. But if severe truncal regurgitation present, then it is a poor prognostic indicator for long term survival. On TE, look for the residual VSD, uh, PFO, then the coronary artery flow and PA flow should be checked. Uh, right to left sending should be expected at the level of PFO. And uh, pulmonary stenosis at the distal anastomosis site is a common complication. So, after coming off bypass, direct measurement of RV pressure and distal PA pressure should be taken by the surgeon to rule out these complications. Intraoperative placement of pulmonary artery or left atrial catheters will be helpful in the management of uh, post-operative pulmonary hypertensive crisis. Because of limited space in the mediastinum, secondary to the placement of an RV to PA conduit, adequate drainage is critical to prevent tamponade and it is uh, often useful to leave the sternum open until the pulmonary compliance recovers. As closure of the chest can create pulmonary tamponade with compression of the conduit and decrease filling of the right heart. Now, after the shifting the patient in uh, CTRR, post-operatively low cardiac output can be expected due to high PVR and right ventricular failure. A high PVR will always be present in infants with pre-operative elevation of PA pressures and those who undergo delay repair. Second complication is pulmonary hypertensive crisis presents as a low cardiac output and right ventricular failure. Evidence of this potentially fatal events is essential to decrease the mortality and morbidity associated with repair. So, events that trigger a hypertensive crisis such as hypoxia, hypercapnia, acidosis, pain, airway stimulation and left right ventricular failure must be avoided. After shifting the patient in recovery unit, this patient usually kept sedated and paralyzed for the initially first 24 to 48 hour after repair 
and this uh, plays a large role in the avoidance of or treatment of a pulmonary hypertensive crisis. Uh, inhaled nitric oxide and sildenafil or bosentan are used to reduce the incidence of pulmonary hypertensive episodes. Many patients will have elevated PA pressures for a prolonged period of time and if the increased pressure do not compromise cardiac output, they can be tolerated. Due to the presence of non-compliant right ventricle, uh, usually maintain high CVP around 12 to 13 centimeter of H2O and uh, there is a very small amount increase in uh, cardiac output in response to a large infusion of volume. Pacing should be done at 140 to 160 to maintain adequate cardiac output and ventilate with low mean airway pressures as increased intrathoracic pressure will uh, decrease the cardiac output and increase the PA pressure. Keep the infant well oxygenated keeping PO2 around 100 to 150 and hypocapnic that is PCO2 around 30 to 35. Uh, cautiously correct the metabolic acidosis with soda bicarbonate and uh, due to VSD closure and RVOT incisions uh, arrhythmias are common. Most common is right bundle branch block, others are junctional ectopic tachycardia, atrial tachycardia and in 3 to 5 percent of cases CHV occur. Now, follow up should be done to detect long term complications. A small conduit needs to be changed to a larger size usually at 2 to 3 years of age. Calcification of the valve in the conduit may occur within 1 to 5 years of age which require reoperation. Progressive truncal valve insufficiency may develop and truncal valve repair or replacement may be needed. These are the references from which I have collected the material for this presentation. Thank you.